Welcome, everyone. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, welcome you on behalf of the Atlantic Council uh, to today's gathering, representing the intrepid Fred Kemp, our president, and the entire Atlantic Council family. Thank you all for joining us for the launch event of our Global Business and Economics Program's Euro Growth Initiative. It's a great pleasure to welcome European Commission Vice President Jyrki Katainen to discuss a roadmap for European growth, an incredibly timely topic to kick off this important new initiative. Mr. Vice President, thank you so much for being here. It's really an honor to have you in our presence. I'm also delighted to welcome both co-chairs of this initiative here this morning. On the U.S. side, we have former ambassador to the European Union and former deputy secretary of the U.S. Treasury, Stuart Eisenstadt, who we'll turn to in just a moment. And on the European side, we have former European Commission president and former Prime Minister of Portugal, President Jose Manuel Barroso. Thanks enormously to both of you for lending your time and expertise to today's important initiative. Now, before we begin, I'd like to note that our event here is on the record and is also being live streamed online. For those of you on Twitter, please follow along using the hashtags investEU and Eurogrowth. We're gathered here at a moment of tremendous opportunity and challenge for the transatlantic community. As here in the United States, we're experiencing one of the most animated elections in recent history. Our allies in Europe face a multitude of geopolitical and economic tensions, from stagnation across markets and the continued debt crisis to the prolonged struggle on migration that has given way to the increasingly likely Brexit referendum. Europe, a region of significant geopolitical and strategic importance to the United States, has reached an historic juncture at which the decisions they make have the potential to shape the, geo the, the global political and economic stage for decades to come. As chair of the Atlantic Council, a think tank that promotes constructive U.S. leadership and engagement in the world based on the central role of the Atlantic community, I'm keenly aware of the importance of working alongside our allies and partners to secure a more prosperous future. Founded upon that premise, our Euro Growth Initiative aims to increase awareness in the United States of the needs for a stronger European partner while also creating a transatlantic platform that enables the exchange of best practices between the U.S. and Europe for long-term economic growth. For our first event in this initiative, we're most honored to have European Commission Vice President Jyrki Katainen join us today to discuss this very important and timely issue. Vice President Katainen has been one of the key architects of the Juncker Commission's investment plan for Europe a robust strategy aimed at jump-starting European growth by removing obstacles to investment, provi providing visibility and technical assistant assistance to investment projects, and increasing the effectiveness of new and existing financial resources. Before we turn to Vice President Katainen's expertise, I would like to invite Atlantic Council Executive Committee, mem committee member and U.S. co-chair for the Euro Growth Initiative, Ambassador Stuart, Stuart Eisenstadt to the platform to say just a few words. With a decade and a half of public service spanning three U.S. administrations, Ambassador Eisenstadt has held a number of key senior positions, including Deputy Secretary of the Treasury and U.S. Ambassador to the European Union. The true Atlanticist that he is, I can think of no better person to preview the work of the Euro Growth Initiative. Following Vice President Katainen's keynote speech, we'll jump into a panel discussion with Vice President Katainen and President Barroso, moderated by our very own Andrea Montanino. Thank you all so much for being here. Ambassador, the time is yours. Thank you, Governor uh, and Ambassador and uh, President Kemp. Welcome uh, to everyone. It's a special day for us at the Atlantic Council as we launch this new Euro Growth Initiative to find sustainable growth path for Europe. Uh, in addition to being Ambassador of the EU and, and Deputy Treasury Secretary, I was also Under Secretary of Commerce and Under Secretary of State. And in all of those positions, Europe was really central to my uh, role in that in the Clinton administration. I'm really honored to have as my European co-chair, Jose Manuel Barroso, 
twice elected and serving for 10 years as president of the European Commission, former prime minister of Portugal, uh, and I am most appreciative uh, of your involvement, Mr. President. I want to make it clear that this initiative is not intended to point at what Europe does wrong and what we do right. We see this as a two-way street. We have a lot to learn from Europe, from your apprenticeship programs to your superior transportation infrastructure and high-speed rail to your smaller gap in income inequality, and to the fact that if one looks year after year at the OECD figures on attainment in science and engineering for your young students, you score much higher on those figures and on the math as well than, than we do. The U.S. actually has the fourth highest income inequality in the world, and we have valuable lessons to learn from you and your social democracies on how to achieve both social justice and economic growth. However, it cannot be ignored that for the last 25 years, not a function of the financial crisis, the last 25 years, European growth has been around 1% lower each year. Headlines on Europe, of course, are dominated by the debt crisis, bailouts, unemployment, recession, deflation, which threaten to undermine capital flows, innovation, and market confidence. There's less innovation, less, fewer IPOs, less deep capital markets. Venture capital is much greater on this side of the Atlantic than on yours. As you slowly recover from the Great Recession, Europe is also obviously wrestling with the tempest of geopolitical tensions caused by the migration crisis, the Russian-Ukraine conflict, and the Middle East turmoil. We often forget that you're only a few hundred kilometers from a lot of the turmoil in the Middle East. Our challenges are to create together ways to overcome the barriers to growth and put Europe and the United States on sustainable growth paths. I see this as not just an economic imperative for you, but as an economic and geopolitical imperative for the U.S. We have a great deal riding on your success. When we have geopolitical problems, whether it's Russia or Iran, we don't turn to Asia, we turn to Europe because Europe shares our values and our interests. You are an essential partner. And to make sure that you are a stronger partner, encouraging greater growth is essential. As you'll hear uh, very soon, the European Commission already has a very good strategy to jumpstart economic growth and to get you in the short and medium and long term onto a sustainable growth pattern. The European Energy Union, your Capital Markets Union, the New Stability and Growth po pa Pact, and as our speaker will describe also the new investment uh, Juncker plan. You're in for a real treat as we were at a breakfast and hearing from Vice President Caitlin who will explain all of this. Some figures are really enlightening. Europe by far is our greatest trading and investment partner. In 2014, the U.S. stock of foreign direct, direct investment in the EU was $2.5 trillion compared to only $60 billion in China. Indeed, American investment in tiny Ireland is three times greater than it is in China. U.S. companies and investors stand to gain much more from 1% or 2% increases in EU growth over the long term. With the right mix of policies, Europe is going to turn a corner, and I'm confident that they will. And the whole point of the Euro Growth Initiative is to bring together the best experts on both sides of the Atlantic to try to help the European Commission and the member states develop policies that will accelerate growth. We believe that you are going to be taking the right steps and that we can help you do so. 
I also want to say something on a personal level, and that is that there has been over the last seven years too little emphasis on Europe. We come to Europe when we have a crisis, when we have Iran, when we have Russia. But the fact is that with the so-called pivot to Asia, with the focus on TPP, with the focus on China, there now needs to be a much greater emphasis on Europe. One of my other hats is to be the U.S. Chair of the Transatlantic Business Council. And the business community is very invested in making sure we do this together to create a trade and investment partnership through TTIP. It is a zero-sum game. It is a deficit-free growth strategy. And I believe that there is a real interest in this administration and Mike Froman uh, and his counterparts in Europe in trying to complete the framework for TTIP by the end of the administration. It is critical that we establish European and U.S. standards for products, not Chinese standards. TTIP would serve as an economic NATO, a new alliance together shaping the rules of global trade. So without any further ado, I want to hand the podium to European Commission Vice President for Growth, Jobs, and Investment, Jyrki Katenen. He comes with an enormously impressive background. He was the Prime Minister of Finland from 2011 to 2014 before assuming his important position at the Commission. He was also the Finance Minister and Deputy Prime Minister of Finland between 2007 and 2011. So thank you very much. Again, President Barroso, thank you for your leadership of this, and we look forward, uh, Mr. President, uh, Vice President, to hearing your remarks. Governor, uh, Ambassador, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming to this event and thanks very much for, for organizing this uh, very valuable event. It's very important for us to have a chance to, to discuss with our American counterparts on, on the joint efforts we have to do together in various fields, especially in, uh, on economics and on, on trade. Ambassador, I do appreciate what you said about the importance of TTIP. I will also mention it in my speech, but you put it very right way uh, when you say that uh, it's the way to stimulate economy, it's the way to achieve a political power to set European American standards to world trade. And one should not underestimate this, uh, th this impact of TTIP, and that's why there is a strong support in the European Commission and in the, UA, in the EU on, on the work what Mike Froman and Cecilia Malmström is doing, trying to achieve a deal. It's really a pleasure to be here. It's really a pleasure to have a uh, chance to discuss, uh, to discuss with, um, with you. I'm particularly glad to see Jose Manuel here. Jose Manuel Parosa is a very close friend of mine. We worked together very closely when he still was a president of the commission, uh, as a prime minister, and, and we not only we did not only meet in the in the very long European Council meetings, which usually started at at 3 p.m. and lasted until 3 a.m. But uh, but uh, we had a regular change of views on various issues. So so it's very nice to see you see you, Jose Manuel, here. I joined the Commission right at the end of the the, the Jose Manuel's second term in 2014, and we have gone through the whole. Um, before that, we had gone through the whole economic crisis together in various positions, and and now I I concentrate purely on the on the European issues after I stepped down as a Prime Minister of Finland. Some of our challenges which we have faced and will face are very difficult to handle, but uh, it's crystal clear, especially after the financial crisis, that we are living in an era 
where the challenge, most, the biggest challenges are too big to handle only in national level. And that's why there is a strong widespread support everywhere in Europe for further integration of Europe. Let's look at the economic growth, let's look at the climate change, terrorism, migration, they all are issues which are too big to handle only in national level. And in order to have an integrated approach on these challenges, we need strong institutions such as Commission to provide an anchor for European decision making and set the long term priorities our citizen, citizens expect. The new Commission under Jean Claude Juncker has set out 10 priorities for the next five years. Number one of those 10 is giving a new boost for jobs, growth, and investment. And I would like to add competitiveness. This is my job now, and I'm very excited about it. I won't explain uh, what we are already doing and why I have come here to the United States to take things forward. I'm convinced our partnership is critical to shaping the kind of the world we all want to live in uh, the 21st century. We will come back to the bigger picture in a moment, but uh, let's start with something very concrete, in, in many cases, literally concrete, uh, as we are now building the essential infrastructure of Europe's uh, future. Investment suffered badly during the crisis as people focused on the immediate needs, not the long term, longer term. Both public and private sectors needed to rebuild their balance sheets. As in the US, we had to rewrite our financial rule book. But now we need to build for the future, to get capital moving again to our companies so they can grow, uh, innovate and create new and better jobs. Our plan to do this has three pillars. The first pillar is the creator, is the creator of a uh, European Fund for Strategic Investment. This is so-called Juncker uh, Fund. We are using European resources to provide guarantees, loans or equity to higher risk private sector investment. The aim is to mobilize private liquidity in the market to constructive and, and profitable investments by providing risk financing. We have changed the banking regulation globally and it has had some, also some negative impact. So the bank's risk pairing capacity is somewhat lower than it used to be. There is plenty of liquidity in the market, but risk financing is quite a scarce resource. So that's why we wanted to establish a new fund which is providing, which is part of the European Investment Bank and it provides risk financing. By doing so, uh, it, it, it wants to mobilize private money uh, to the investment. So basically, EIB will use around 60 billion over the next three years on these purposes, and this is supposed to mobilize around uh, 250 billion from private sector. We already have 42 Pro 45 projects which have uh, used FC financing. In addition to this, there are more than 100 agreements between intermediary banks and FC on SME financing, innovative SME financing, and these uh, two strands together will trigger around 60 billion additional investment in Europe. But we need to go far beyond even that. There is only so much we can or should do with public money. So the other two pillars focus on private sector. I have just come from Wall Street and I was in the city of London right at the, at the start of my mandate. There is money out there, there's plenty of liquidity and it is looking for good investments. We have projects across Europe that need financing. So the second pillar is about putting them together through an online portal that will go live in the coming months. It's a kind of a dating agency for investment. The final pillar is about getting a better environment for investors. I'm not talking here about candlelight and soft music. 
What I mean is widening and deepening the world's largest single market, cutting back on unnecessary regulation that hits the smaller businesses hardest, and connecting ourselves to our most important economic partners. We have specific strategies to create a digital single market and energy union in Europe. Together, these will transform our economies and societies, the way uh, we live and work and ensure sustainable and secure futures for our citizens. We are working towards a more resilient economic and monetary union and, and building a genuine capital markets union to finance the real economy. This will reduce our dependence on bank fund funding and offer more opportunities for investors wherever they may be. This brings me to the final point about Europe's place uh, in, in the world. And it is the reason why I'm here today. I have always believed that Europe can, that, that, that Europe can only succeed when we reach out beyond our frontiers. That is true for trade, of, of trade and even more so of investment. The scale and interconnected nature of the transatlantic economic relationship is unparalleled anywhere in the world. Together we account for nearly 30% of global merchandise trade, about 40% of world trade in services, and well over half of foreign direct investment. Approximately 50 million jobs are linked to the transatlantic economy. TTIP will give us the chance to take that to a whole new level and provide a further boost uh, to our recovery. I'm working very closely with Cecilia Malmström to help to make that happen, and I look forward to seeing Mike Froman uh, again tomorrow. A fair and balanced TTIP will strengthen our economies without compromising on any of the high standards our citizens expect. TTIP would be the cheapest way to stimulate economic growth in both sides uh, of the Atlantic. But it will also strengthen the union on both sides by showing that we can do when we work together. We can make deals that work for us both and help to write the rules of the global economy in the 21st century. These have never been more important as the world uh, is changing fast around us. Europe faces many challenges. We will have to make some tough choices, but we have come through difficult times in the past. Our societies are resilient because they are fair. I still believe strongly in the European social model, but for that to be sustainable, we also need growth and competitiveness. That is what I'm focusing on, and that is why I'm, I was very pleased to hear about the Euro Growth Initiative that you are launching today here at the Atlantic Council. Ladies and gentlemen, under the leadership of uh, Jose Manuel and Ambassador Einstein, I am sure will um, make an important contribution to our, to our shaping, to, to shaping our work, and I wish you very success in taking this forward. Thank you very much for your attention. Jose, please. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for being here. And uh, I'm Andrea Montanino, the director of the Global Business and Economics Program of the Atlantic Council. And actually, I'm, I, I'm really honored to share this stage with two uh, truly Europeans, uh, Vice President Catania and Jose Manuel Barroso. Actually, the whole three work at the European Commission in different roles, let me say. I was just a junior uh, some, some years ago. Um, I don't need to reintroduce our, uh, our panelists. Uh, just let me say that uh, uh, Jose Manuel is currently visiting professor um, on international economic policy and a policy fellow of the Liechtenstein Institute on self-determination at Princeton. And also he was honored some time ago with the Distinguished Leadership Award of the Atlantic Council. So we are happy to have you back here. And also I'm particularly happy uh, of launching the Euro Growth Initiative with a key player in Europe on growth, which is uh, Vice President Katainen, and uh, uh, with Jose 
Barroso and Ambassador Eisenstadt's chairs. This will be really, uh, I hope, uh, a good service we can do uh, to, uh, to Europe. Uh, I will have some questions for, for both of you, and then, of course, I will uh, uh, leave the floor, uh, and I will uh, leave the audience to, to put your uh, own questions to um, Vice President Katainen and, and President uh, Barroso. Before going more on uh, into the economics, I'd like to start with a couple of questions, a broader question on the role of Europe in the future. So let me start with, uh, with, uh, with uh, President Barroso, uh, so you can rest a little bit, your voice. <laughs> uh, in, in an interview you gave to Forbes uh, six months after you, uh, your term as President of the European Commission ended, you said, I quote, uh, what is happening today is not the decline of Europe. Together, Europe is a very important power. Uh, I would say even that together it's an emerging power, unquote. So given the events that have unfolded since then, uh, the continuation of the Greek crisis, even if I know you don't like the Brexit word, uh, the migrant crisis, the strengthening of nationalist sentiments in Europe, uh, the looming Brexit, or as we say, and as Ambassador Sullivan says, the hoping remaining, um, so, uh, I, do you still still feel that way? That Europe is really a, a, a global power. Uh, how how do you feel about that? Yes, I will respond directly to your question. But first, let me say my pleasure to be here with Vice President Katainen, such a good friend, and also to support. I would like, as former President of the Commission, to fully support what you are doing, what new Commission is doing, name of this investment plan. As you know, in politics, sometimes predecessors don't like successors, <laughs> and successors don't like predecessors. That's not the case. I'm not one of those politicians that believe that nothing existed before I was born, and that nothing will exist after I leave. On the contrary, I believe this current commission, led by my good friend also Jean-Claude Juncker, and having in such a distinguished position, Katainen is doing everything they can do to uh, support this uh, agenda for growth and competitiveness. And I just really want to very sincerely, and this is not just a formality, congratulate you for that. Answering your question, I know the negativism and the pessimism about Europe, not only here in the States. I have to fight that every day when I'm teaching at Princeton now, but also in Europe. I call it sometimes the intellectual glamour of pessimism. But in reality, if you have a medium-term perspective, you'll see that there is no reason for this um, fatalist, catastrophist, negativist views on Europe. And I can share with you my own experience. 2004, 2014, leading the Commission. In 2004, we were 15 countries. When I left, and today we are 28. So we have almost doubled our membership during all this crisis. During five years, I've heard every day, Grexit, Greece is going to leave. I mean, Greece is still there. <laughs> the crumbling of the euro every day, but come on. The euro is one of the two most important currencies in the world. It's a credible, stable, strong currency. So come on, let's put things in perspective. I can share with you my experience. 92, I was a young foreign minister. In the European Council, at that time, the foreign ministers were participating in the European Council. Today, it's only the heads of government. I was with Mitterrand, with Helmut Kohl, with Jacques Delors. Was Europe big better then? False. Absolutely false. We were only 12 countries. Half of Europe was under totalitarian Soviet regime. The three Baltic countries were not even independent. So, when I see some people, including in Brussels Beltway, nostalgic of Europe, oh, the good old days of Europe, which good old days are they speaking of? <laughs> when half of Europe was under communist rule? When Portugal, Spain, or Greece were dictatorships, not being members of the European Union? Or was it in the, in the 12th century, the 20th century, when we had the Shoah, the Holocaust, the worst moment of human history? What is the age d'or, the golden age of Europe people are speaking of? So if you ask me, Europe is stronger today or 20 years ago, of course it is today. I can tell you. When I met uh, from President Obama to the Chinese leadership, 
the way they look at us in China or all over the world is today with much more respect than before. Now, does this mean that we don't have challenges? And of course we have, and very serious, and we are very, and by the way, Vice President Katanen mentioned them. We have a low growth. By the way, what you said, Ambassador Eisenstadt, I really appreciate very much what you said, putting things in perspective. We have a low growth compared to the United States. We are growing below potential. And politically, I think we have today two big problems. One is structural problem that, by the way, I think the United States also have, is how to deal with this rise of populism and nationalism so, and sometimes xenophobic sentiment. And we have a more concrete challenge uh, to avoid Britain leaving the European Union, which I believe will be a very negative development, not only for Britain, but for Europe and for the West, if you want to use that, uh, that, uh, that uh, concept. Because uh, with the Eurosceptics in Britain, there will be someone f commemorating. It will be President Putin from Russia. It will be a blow also in terms of security and geopolitical, um, our common geopolitical interests with the United States. So these are the problems we have. Uh, and they are serious. And that's why, and thank you, Yirki, for your words also of support to our Euro, Euro Growth Initiative. I believe we have to do more together with the Europeans and the Americans. And that's where I really appreciated the words, very sincere words of Ambassador Eisenstadt. I have to tell you very frankly, during these last years in the Commission, I did not always felt the level of complicity I would like to have felt between Europe and the United States. We need more of this complicity. And that's why what we are doing with your uh, investment plan for growth. And I mean, on a more modest level, what we can do here with our Euro Growth Initiative can be important to commit more, namely the private sector on both sides. We need indeed some kind of a multi-stakeholder uh, coalition. For instance, I know many American companies that want to help Europe tackle this issue of refugees. Because if we don't succeed, if we don't support, for instance, the very courageous position of Angela Merkel, then there will be a temptation to put in question uh, Schengen, to create new borders, which is, of course, negative from a political point of view, but also from an economic point of view. The risk of fragmentation of the internal market, they exist. So my short answer to you is yes, we are better. But yes, we have problems. And the best way to solve the problems is not nostalgic uh, to be nostalgic of a past that did not exist, but on the contrary, confident on the resources of Europe. Very good. Uh, I hope we just listen positive words about Europe from this stage and in the coming, coming month. But I need uh, Vice President Katainen to ask you something about uh, uh, the agreement that the European institution reached with, uh, with the United Kingdom uh, some, some days and weeks ago. Uh, so head of the referendum, there has been this agreement uh, that hopefully will convince uh, British people to stay and to continue to join uh, the Union. Uh, but do you think this agreement can be in a way a precedent for other countries uh, that would like not to deepen the European Union, not to continue for more integration? In a way, what I see, what it seems to me now that we are not moving towards a sort of two-speed Europe, where everybody has the same end point. But probably we are moving towards a system where you have a core group of countries and another group of countries. So the end point can be different. So how, how you see this, uh, apart from the, say the, 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 the outcome of the referendum, but do you see consequence for, for other countries, uh, or you think that the integration process will, will continue and how it will continue? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we managed to find uh, or make a fair deal with uh, Britain and it's, it was also fair to the other 27 member states. There were a few elements which were very important to British Prime Minister and British people. The first one was uh, that um, Britain must have a opportunity to influence to the future of European integration. In other words, uh, Britain cannot be in, in worse position than Eurozone countries. So the further, further integration of Eurozone cannot harm British interest. And I, I think it's fair. 
uh, fair to, to acknowledge it. The second point was that uh, Britain wanted to refocus the, the work what the Commission is doing or the EU is doing to competitiveness related issues, the single market issues, to trade issues, etc. And that was very, very good. I mean, this is exactly what I'm doing at the moment. Uh, the third element, uh, Britain wanted to get uh, rid of uh, uh, ever, ever closer union um, thinking. So there is a fair deal that Britain doesn't need to be, uh, or they have exemption or they have opt out to, to ever closer union thinking, whereas <laughs> the others uh, are more or less saying that there's a need for further integration. It's quite a semantic issue, but it was important to Britain, and, and I think we found a good compromise on this. And finally, uh, Britain, Britain wanted to get some limits to how much social security benefits should be paid to the families or the people who are coming to Britain uh, from the other countries. And there again, we found a compromise which was suitable to everybody. So no, now, Prime Minister Cameron, together with uh, Chancellor Osborne, are leading yes campaign and in, and he, he he's explaining very thoroughly what it means if Britain wouldn't be part of the European decision making. We will see very interesting, very deep going internal discussion in in the in UK of existential or fundamental issues, values, and there is not that much what we can do as a Commission. We don't want to interfere the national procedures. But coming back to your second question <clears throat> whether the other countries want to see further integration or, or not. I have not seen any major changes in member states' mind whether we, whether we need more integration or not. i just give you a couple of examples. What, what we are doing at the moment, we are creating digital single market, meaning that we want to harmonize regulatory environment across Europe in order to have level playing field, one single market, internal market for the European companies for European consumers, but also for third country businesses to, to operate in Europe. Why we are doing this? Because our stakeholders ask us to do it. The member states said, we need more integrated approach on, on single market. We are doing the same thing with energy sector. We are creating energy internal market. We are doing the same thing with capital market union. Just to men mention three major internal market projects with which we are working uh, on at the moment. And we are doing this because our owners, our citizens, our companies, countries asked us to do it, do so. We, are, we have 24 uh, trade negotiations going on with third countries. Why? Because our companies and member states ask us to negotiate fair trade and investment deal with the third countries. We are uh, working very close with uh, <clears throat> very big uh, challenges like um, migration issue. Every single prime minister in Europe has said that this is too big issue to deal only in national level. We need a European solution. So again, the member states see that when there are big threats coming outside, it's better to be together. It's better to be united. So even if we had or even, even though we have uh, challenges, it doesn't mean that the, the understanding of being together would have disappeared. There is political populism in some countries, nationalism, but it's uh, very similar to what you have seen here in the United States. It's not the European phenomenon also. I think it's quite common phenomena everywhere in the Western world. And we just have to deal with it. We have to find a way to, to do necessary decisions, even if it was more difficult than, than in, uh, in the past. So um, I, uh, uh, or finally, if you look at the financial crisis, it was the last point when everybody saw that it would have been impossible to solve all the crises and things if we hadn't had a uni unified and, and common European approach to do it. Decision making, of course, is quite difficult with 28 member states, but the result is much better once we reach a deal than if 28 member states would try to address the, uh, the, the problems by themselves. 
Uh, if I can just uh, follow up on one, one point you make, I think it's very important to understand in this country that despite all the difficulties uh, of the decision process in Europe, mm -hmm. Europe was able, because of its institution, and especially because of its European institutions, to deal with the crisis. I mean, Europeans were able to set up the European uh, mechanism, uh, the EFSF, uh, mm. uh, to start the banking union. Uh, all these things were possible because of the European institution. And I always said to my American friends, imagine a crisis like that in another country, big country in the world, Brazil, Russia, you can mention whatever. Who could deal this? Who, how they could make or find a solution? Europe had the strong institution to do so. I think this is an achievement that we have always to, to remind to ourselves. Um, but uh, Mr. Barroso, uh, uh, Vice President Katainen uh, mentioned several initiatives, uh, the Digital Single Market, Capital Markets Union. If you should make a ranking of priorities uh, for strengthening European economy, uh, which would be your first top one, two? If there is any uh, fiscal union, banking union, capital markets union, digital single market, or you see, I mean, the need for more for the comprehensive strategy. We have to see what has to be done at European at national level. Mm -hmm. At European mm -hmm. level, I have no doubts that the priorities put forward by the Commission are the right ones to complete the internal market. And it's indeed absurd that we still have in Europe 28 different markets for digital. Mm. The market for goods in Europe is, I would say, perfect. There is almost no, I mean, there is absolutely no discrimination. So in Helsinki, from Helsinki to Lisbon, it's, it's really a market in goods. But in digital, if you go from Luxembourg to Belgium, it's a, a completely different regime because of the copyright because of national resistance to that. And the market of the future will be digital. So this is important. And there has been a lot of, of resistance. I know that also from my own experience. The governments, namely the incumbent, sometimes the incumbent companies in technology, in, in, the, in telecommunication, they do not want sometimes the, the common markets to exist in digital. So that's the other thing is energy, also of geopolitical importance. A lot has been already done, but much more can be done and uh, certainly the capital markets. Now, we have launched, it was in my own commission, uh, the banking union. Hmm. When for the first time I used the word banking union, two of my colleagues in the European Council, two prime ministers told me, you cannot speak about banking union. It is not in the treaties. And it's true it's not in the treaty. And my answer was, yes, it's not in the treaty, but to fulfill the goals of the treaty, including monetary stability, we need a banking union. Hmm. And now we have, not yet complete, but we have common, a supervisory mechanism. The European Central Bank in some areas has more power than the Federal Reserve here in the United States. So we have gone further in integration than people think, counterintuitively. During all these years, in fact, if you look at the competence of the European Union now and five years before, now the European Union has much more competence, the banking union, the single supervisory mechanism, single resolution mechanism, and now the Commission is trying to get the agreement of the governments on a common deposit guarantee scheme. So complete banking union is critically important for the, for the um, euro area, namely. And I want to underline again this point, against what is the common perception of the European Union is coming back, uh, is rolling back its integration. No. <laughs> Today, the European Commission has more competences in terms of economic governance than five years or say six years ago. Mm. And European institutions like the European Central Bank, the European Banking Agency, and so on and so forth, more as well. Now, of course, there is a, a political problem. That problem, there is not always support at level, so-called the citizens level for that. And there are threats in terms of political sustainability of this, this acquis and this progress. But the reality is that when there was a discussion, it was, for more and not for less integration. Now, but apart from this, what we can do at European level, I would say the most important priority is in that national level. It's the reforms for competitiveness. Mm. And that is an important issue because we cannot always put the, the blame on Europe. It's what the governments do or do not. Mm. And our governments, I would say the name of the game in, in Europe today is reform. 
from the left to the right, I think nobody is actively going on against the idea of a reform, structural reform or competitiveness, flexibility of labor markets, the revision of the, the, the retirement age, and things like that. But I think there are some resistance still. And in some cases, I'm a little bit concerned. So we need to do more to promote the reform for more competitive Europe at national level. That the Commission can guide, can, can um, inspire, can motivate, but it, in fact, it's a national competence. How, for instance, the reform of the labor market, this is a national competence. It's the government that have to do it, if they have the courage to do it or not. Retirement age, things like that. And basically, the, the way has been, I think, the, the direction has been the right one, but I think we need more ambition if you want uh, Europe to become more competitive. Uh, <clears throat> again, thinking about how to stimulate growth, uh, uh, not just in the short term, but also in the medium to long term. Uh, the G20 just met in Shanghai. And as often happened, right, there were no major conclusions. But what was interesting to me was the debate that came out between those that advocated for, say, more, a more active use of the public budget, say, and was clear the IMF, the International Money Fund position, the OECD, and those on the other side, and Germany was the, the front runner, saying that, no, it's not time to increase our debt and deficit uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, one could say, okay, a, a way to find a compromise between the two positions, say, those that have a fiscal space can do a little more, a mm -hmm. little bit more. But uh, as you know, Vice President, I mean, the European Commission consider only five countries fully compliant with the Stability and Growth Pact. One is Germany, the other four are small economies, so they cannot have a, a huge impact from, from, for the aggregate demand in Europe. Uh, so my question to you uh, uh, is, what is your position your official position and your unofficial position, see? <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, whether you see space uh, to increase public debt in Europe, and in case for doing what? Uh, while uh, G20 was meeting, uh, President Juncker went to Rome uh, basically to discuss this. So what, what, what's, your, what's your view? Well, there is, uh, as I said, there is very little room for fiscal stimulus in, in, many, in, in Europe as a whole. There are a few countries who can afford to do it without jeopardizing their credibility. But uh, we have to acknowledge also that if we want to get more jobs, more investment, the, uh, the confidence must be there. And uh, if you start stimulating without real fiscal, fiscal space and, and if market sees that you're public uh, economy is, is going to be ruined, then, then you lose the confidence and, and the outcome is even more negative than it is at the moment. So there are few countries who can afford to stimulate the economy and, and we do hope that they will use their space, but not as a general rule to, to let the public debt rise again. Uh, there are two other issues which can be done. The member states could prioritize investment in the public expenditures. So they could cut somewhere and put money to investment. Another issue, I fully support what uh, Jose Manuel said about the structural reforms. Sometimes uh, you can get the same stimulus effect if you change the structures than if you lower taxation or expanded your, your budgets. For instance, uh, labor market reforms or commodity market reforms and things like that, reforms can really stimulate economy even in short term, even in short term. And if you look at the challenges in European economy, they are much more structural in nature than cyclical. So at the same time, when you take care of the long term sustainability, you can stimulate economy if you do reforms like many of our member states are doing at the moment. And final point, I, I will not go deeper on this, but, <clears throat> but what the Commission is doing, creating new market by harmonizing uh, single market regulation and by opening up uh, uh, better or uh, having better deals with the third countries, it's also a stimulus uh, uh, measure 
not immediately right now, but, uh, but in the medium and long term. Okay. Jose Manuel, do you want to <laughs> give your view? Give <laughs> that my you, official. You uh, can be more uh, unofficial, say. No, I'm, uh, I'm uh, since I left office, my official and unofficial po positions coincide. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so my opinion is very sincerely, it's a mistake. A mistake that sometimes many American economists make, in my opinion, to recommend Europe a kind of a stimulus demand uh, across the board. It's really a mistake. And they have not always given a good help when we were trying to deal with the crisis, namely with Greece, when they were suggesting completely unrealistic um, uh, ways. Because in Europe, we have to see the situation. In terms of fiscal, we have to see the situation in each country. We were in front of the market panic. So it was obvious that we had to front load the fiscal adjustment. And contrary to what is sometimes the public perception, that the uh, fiscal rigor was an enemy of growth. In fact, the countries that have done more, they were the most successful. Okay. If you look at Ireland, they pushed a very ambitious program uh, in terms of uh, a fiscal adjustment. I mean, Ireland now has, I think, a growth of 7%. <laughs> Spain and Portugal were able to conclude their uh, adjustment program, Spain only for the banking sector, Portugal uh, full-fledged, with a very, very contractionary policy. And uh, if you look at countries not in the euro area at that time, like Latvia, even Britain, not being a member of the euro area, Britain was one of the countries implementing a more tough budget. And that made confidence come back. So of course, we know that in the immediate term, it will be probably more pleasant to have a stimulus, while demand stimulus. But frankly, I believe in Europe, it will be a mistake. For those countries that have no fiscal space, I mean, Germany can do more. And by the way, in the analysis of the commission, now we have the so-called macroeconomics imbalance procedure. Germany has a surplus that enables Germany to do more to support demand. By the way, I think the best way for Germany to support demand is to, to real liberalize the service market yeah. because Germany is very close in terms of services. It's much easier if you want to make a contract in Spain <coughs> for a foreign company if you go, than in Germany in services. You see? And that's what has to be done to support demand, not to create now. Because Europe has a huge problem of debt. Today, we don't see it very clearly because of the policy of the European Central Bank. Yeah. <laughs> because European Central Bank, by, through quantitative easing, is of course, I mean, this is not a problem. But it can come back if we don't commit to fiscal prudence. Mm -hmm. So on that point of view, I'm much closer. And now I'm speaking completely free <laughs> of any pop. So I'm, I'm not in public office, and I'm candidate, candidate to nothing. So uh, I'm much closer to the, Amer to the German position than to other positions. I think, basically, that's the right position. Now, of course, afterwards, you have to be flexible. And by the way, I bet I don't think we can accuse this commission today of uh, a lack of flexibility, no. frankly. So um, <laughs> the point is um, uh, we should commit to that. Uh, and but we should put our focus on the structural reforms, and that is my final point now. And one thing it's important to understand: the best way to to encourage structural reform in some of our countries is precisely by the fiscal side, because it's the only way they have to push the reforms inside. For instance, Italy. We mentioned Italy and the uh, Juncker discussion with uh, with Italian authorities, Renzi. Italy is uh, one of the. I mean, I. I'm really a lover of Italy. I think it's the most creative country in the world. But so how is it that Italy, that is the most creative country in the world, in the world's history, has not a more dynamic economy today? The best way to become it is, in fact, to reduce overspending of state. The layers of administration in Italy are really, I mean, are really a problem. I've been discussing this with Berlusconi, with Letta, with uh, Renzi, uh, with uh, Monti. And they all say that they are going to do it. So let's hope that now it happens. Because in fact, the best way to become, for Italy to become more competitive is to reduce the overspending of the state. <laughs> That's what they have to do. And so if now we give the wrong signal, no, no, come on, go on, you can increase spending, 
I mean, I think it's really a mistake. And I'm, I'm, very, co I'm very convinced of that because, uh, uh, um, I mean, we have seen the successful countries in Europe who were those who were making some kind of, of uh, structural reforms, including Germany, because Germany was the sick man of Europe some time ago. People tend to forget that. I remember in debate, Germany was the sick man of Europe. What happened? Germany started some structural reforms, indeed in, this, in the previous government, even before Merkel, and they become more competitive. So, and it was not by increasing public expenditure. It was exactly the opposite, yeah. by become, becoming more flexible, namely in the labor market. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I have so many other questions to you, but I would like to turn to, to the audience if there is any, any issue. Please. Uh, we have a microphone. The gentleman there. If you can introduce yourself. Good morning, and thank you so much for being here. My name is Konstantinos Kanalopoulos. I'm a graduate student at Johns Hopkins Science. Um, I have two questions. My first question has to do with regards to the Greek program. Recently, the former head of the IMF task force, Paul Thompson, stated that the overstimistic assumptions will cause Brexit fears to resurface again. My question to you is whether you believe that there are these Brexit fears might resurface again. And despite of the fact that, fingers crossed, up to now this is not happening, the fact of the matter is that there is no cry end of the Greek crisis in sight. And secondly, my question is, how does the Eurozone and the European Union more broadly strike a delicate balance between austerity and growth. In other words, don't you believe that centralization and democratization should be at the heart of our response to this existential crisis? Should we create a Eurozone parliament and shouldn't we create a Eurozone finance minister with a real budget for the European Union? Thank you. Yeah, I think it's Thank you. better to answer. Uh, we have not opened the the final chapter of Greek uh, uh, current history yet. So, uh, so we don't know what will happen, but things look quite encouraging at the moment. The government has uh, uh, finally started to reform the country, and it's always difficult, but they are doing their best. So um, there's, a, there's a review going on in the, in the Greek program and, and we are evaluating how much uh, we have achieved or Greek authorities have managed to do in terms of fulfilling everything what they have promised. So um, I don't want to exaggerate positive, neither negative assessments on, on Greece, but things seem to be moving the right direction and there is no um, major uh, worries that uh, it would be reversed. Also, if you look at the banking sector in, in Greece, it was recapitalized and the money was, which was needed was uh, somewhat lower than what was primarily um, was first uh, anticipated. So the financial sector uh, is as strong as it can be in the current circumstances in Greece. So, um, um, we wasted a lot of time for arguing what is possible and what is not possible. We were, we, we were part of the theoretical question, discussion raised by Greek uh, new government and, and then uh, finance minister Farouk Fakis. We were discussing about uh, different types of economic uh, theories which from our point of view did not have any relevance in real world. So we wasted a lot of time for this kind of, uh, this kind of discussion. But now uh, uh, we have agreed on, on the program and, and it's, um, things are going the right direction. The EMU, the future of EMU, uh, Jose Manuel just said that banking union is the la latest uh, element of EMU, which uh, he initiated and which we have, if not accomplished, but uh, taken uh, to the further step, which is 
probably uh, uh, the biggest uh, issue to, to be finalized, I mean, deposit guarantee scheme. And, <clears throat> and now we have bail-in rule in place. We have all the structures which are necessary to deal with uh, potential failing banks, and all these new structures will support the confidence. That is good. We are also at the same time considering what should be the next steps on uh, on uh, monetary union side. I'm personally a bit skeptical whether we need new institutions, new presidents, new persons, uh, because um, um, the, the, the main issue at the moment is to leave according to new rule base. We have to push member states to do reforms. Otherwise, no new institution can replace the, the shortages we have in our competitiveness. Um, more uh, fundamental issue is which we don't have uh, discussed at all, but uh, if you want it, we could basically discuss about whether we should move towards more American system where central bank don't accept uh, member states' bonds and uh, where there is a big federal uh, automatic stabilizer or budget. So this is more existential issue. But uh, as you can imagine, even if somebody wanted, it would not happen overnight. So we don't have a discussion on this. But it's a very interesting topic, uh, into which direction we should go. But meanwhile, um, the most important thing is to to leave according to new rules and um, push member states to do reforms because uh, what we need more is uh, competitiveness and structural reforms which leads to more competitive structures of our, of our economies. Thank you. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm from uh, Multifence. It's a, a private company here in Washington, D.C. I used to be involved between 2000 and 2008. I used to run three European Commission projects uh, based in Scandinavia. All three of them were integrated projects, as you may know, of course. And uh, in one of the projects, we had 18 countries. Uh, so, uh, my first of all, I'm very happy and congratulate Atlantic Good, good to the question because yeah, we are my question is Thank your you. main investment policy in European Union is regional development policy, which amounts to close to 400 billion dollars for the same period uh, of our strategic investment. Could you tell us uh, how do you relate both? how European regional development policy could reinforce uh, European strategic investment. I think it's almost one trillion, one, yeah, one trillion dollars in total for until 2020, and this is not negligible, and the Americans just don't know it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for raising uh, this issue, because um, we do have, even if we don't have a federal budget for for um, um, leveling the cycles. We, we, we have quite significant budget for investment, and this is exactly what you mentioned, uh, structural um, funds, which are used in various member states to boost uh, investment and to, to strengthen healthy economic structures. The money is used for infrastructure, mostly to knowledge-based infrastructure, but also to, in, uh, to transportation infrastructure and uh, on on many many other <coughs> to many other purposes so now what we are doing to accelerate uh, the, to accelerate uh, its impact is to use structure funds together with EFS side the new fund money in order to get a better uh, leverage so basically this may go to, uh, to technical details, but uh, basically what we are aiming for is to, to use structural funds more as a financial instrument, together with EFSI, for instance, and together with uh, private money, 
to finance various projects or SMEs. So if you use structural funds as a grant, which is the case in most of the cases, uh, uh, then the money is uh, as much as you spend. But if you use it as a financial instrument, the leverage is quite uh, significant. And this is what we are trying to boost more. Please. <clears throat> Anders Åslund, the Atlantic Council. Uh, I would like to turn to you, uh, Vice President Katanen, uh, as a follow-up on this uh, answer you gave on the Euro crisis. You have been the three main areas, the ECOFIN, the European Council, and now in the Commission during the Euro crisis. What do you feel about uh, the distribution of power between these uh, three organs? You rightly complained that the decision-making had been slow, wouldn't it be better now, when you sit in the European Commission, if the European Commission had more power in managing the Euro crisis? Thank you. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, things are now a bit different than they, they, than they were before, because the Commission has, has been given more power to deal with the crises. We have a banking union uh, which has clear rules but also money if needed uh, to be used for failing banks and, and uh, we did not have for instance this instrument in our disposal during the crisis also we have revised the, uh, the, the rules fiscal rules it enables to commission to interfere before the crisis appears uh, to the member states um, economic politics so it's, uh, things are quite different at the moment. But um, I, I sometimes thought in the middle of the crisis when we were criticized that the decision making has been very slow. It, it is true that it was slow, but um, uh, if you take into account that we did not have a suffi sufficient decision making structures in place, we needed to create ones in the middle of the, uh, the crisis. Also, if you look at the, the existential nature of the crisis, it would be surprising if it would have been easy to make decisions, because I mean, they were so fundamental. Thirdly, we were talking about taxpayers' money. How uh, taxpayers' money is used for uh, in, in favor of other taxpayers. How um, Dutch taxpayers' money is used for, for um, uh, Portug Portuguese or, or to Irish people. It's always very, very delicate issues. So, um, uh, even though it took some time, but, uh, but we managed to address the crisis. Uh, Greece is the only country which is not yet uh, come out from the packages of uh, Cyprus is about to come out quite successfully. And uh, at the same time, we created the new rules and, and principles in the, in the EU. So um, if there were new crises, I think it's easier to make decisions at the moment than it was in previous, because we have, we have uh, done quite big reforms. Yes, gentlemen over there. <coughs> over there, Alvaro. Hi, Ned McCulloch from IBM. Um, a number of years ago, the EC launched the whole concept of flex security. And given all of the rapid transformation now, particularly for us at IBM, obviously if we're successful, there's a degree of disruption that accompanies any of the competitive gains. And so we've always been very supportive of the work that was done on flex security, both at the national level and countries like Denmark and by the EC. So in your current role, I wanted to see if you Sorry, had... Sorry, I cannot hear you. Could you speak a bit louder? Yes. Yeah. Um, at the cost of repeating myself, mm. um, at IBM, we have been uh, students of the work that you have done around flex security. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we're very interested in knowing if you think that the EC may bring back that, that strategy in the upcoming years, because it's been very quiet for the last couple of years. If we're successful, there's a degree of disruption that accompanies any of the improvements in competitiveness. And it seems important to address the issues for all the employees and workers as they try to move around. Yeah, th thanks very much for, 
for reminding this issue. Flex security uh, was, uh, I mean, it was very closely linked to Denmark. They had and still have very flexible social security system, which is uh, very, I mean, it, it creates a competitiveness edge to the country. If looking at what is going, going on in the world uh, uh, economy and market at the moment, it's getting more volatile in a sense that we are talking about the fourth uh, industrial revolution, which will change the logic of market and production quite significantly. It's a shift to the better, but it has a cost. So the se second thing is that um, I don't think the human nature will change accordingly. So in order to be productive, in order to be creative, you, have, you need sufficient level of security. And also, you must trust on your future. You must trust on uh, the principles that if I work hard or if I educate myself, it pays off. So that's why the structures in social security uh, are very, very important. If you look at the European countries, there are big differences in social security systems. Some are very stagnated. They are, they are not encouraging at all. They are basically, uh, they, they work against uh, flex security. They can provide quite uh, uh, large uh, security, but they don't encourage you to work and, 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 and things like that. So uh, social security systems are not in the EU's competence. But it doesn't mean that we could not uh, pass the best practices. And if there are uh, good practices created by private companies or by, by whoever, it would be extremely important to pass those messages to our member states. Because we have to be, we have to be active on reforming the social security system in order to improve competitiveness, but also in order to prepare ourselves to, to whatever uh, uh, kind of uh, industrial revolutions there are coming, coming from. So it's, um, it's very, very important. And this is part of the structural reform agenda which we have in, in the Commission. We are screening the healthiness of member states on, on structural side. And, and, but we need good examples of how to reform uh, social security system. Um, yes. Hi, um, I'm Alessandro Leipold from the Lisbon Council, which, as Mr. Barroso knows, is not in Lisbon at all, but in Brussels. Uh, and I just had a question. I mean, uh, you, you very often made the point, correctly so, that uh, the, the European Union was not prepared, didn't have the institutions or structures uh, to handle the crisis at the beginning, and considering that uh, things actually went, went better than one could have feared. But, uh, what I worry about now is that there, for example, the European Stability Mechanism that likes to model itself a little bit on the, on the IMF, lacks the same sort of review procedures and, and, and if you want to call it introspection, uh, that uh, the IMF has made uh, part of its ongoing process. And a specific example is the fact that no country has used its precautionary facilities. And in yeah, fact, it's yeah. almost applauded to say, oh, they did a clean exit, as if using a precautionary facility were a dirty exit. And I think, uh, you know, the governing bodies of the, of the SM should be asking themselves, wouldn't it actually be better mm. if Ireland, Portugal, uh, mm. Cyprus tomorrow, um, uh, and Spain, for that matter, uh, did use its precautionary facilities. At the fund, they've been shown to be useful backups and, and mm. strengthening of confidence. But I'm worried that there is no institutional process to sort of think about these issues. Mm. Jose, maybe you, you, you can, Jose, answer yeah, on this I since think you this, were uh, there. Uh, first of all, I mean, <laughs> let's think where we were. And as Yirki already said, we had, when the financial crisis uh, hit Europe, we were simply not prepared. The economic monetary union had no instruments. While here in the United States there was a debate, but it was possible to do TARP and so on. I mean, because it needed, you did not need to change fundamental institutions in Europe. We had cre to create institutions that were simply non-existent. In fact, the first was the FSM, afterwards the FSF, afterwards the SM. And by the way, the governments of the European Union did not accept 
that it was only European community institutions, because it was a huge mobilization of resources, unprecedented, billions and I mean, hundreds of billions of, of euros. And so the regime that was found was somehow mixed with community competence, but national decision making. Because, for instance, Chancellor Merkel or President Sarkozy at the time said, I mean, we cannot commit billions of euros subject to a decision by the Commission. It has to be done also with our parliaments. I, fair enough. You see, that's why our system, and that's why I want to share with you, because I think in the United States sometimes this was not understood. I remember that during those times, including President Obama, when he was asking us to be more decisive, more bolder, we were telling him and telling many other friends here in the United States, look, it will take some time because Europe by nature is incremental. It's approximative. It's trial and error. I mean, if that's the way it is and that's the way it's going to be. In the, there will be no Philadelphia moment in the future, in the immediate future of Europe. So you cannot be always looking at Europe as if it was United States of America. It's different. We are 28 countries, okay? Now, having said that, I consider, frankly, now looking in retrospect, it was a huge effort of creating new instruments. But those instruments and those institutions, of, of course, are far from optimal in the way they work, um, including the way they work in terms of decision making. Because by definition, they are low uh, speed, time consuming, political capital consuming, and incremental by nature. And we have to deal with that. Now, better than complain about that is to try to make them more effective. I agree with you that there has not been enough thinking about the SM. But the specific issue you are raising has to do with the, the interest of the governments themselves. The government of Portugal, that I know well, but also the government of Ireland, the government of Spain will not they did not want to have a precautionary mm. thing yeah, because of reputation. Mm. Because in terms of their judgment of the markets, if they continue to have some kind of assistance, it, was it would have been considered, they think, as a way of being still not sufficiently <coughs> safe. And let's be honest, also politically, also, they wanted to, sh to tell the opposition, they wanted to tell their public, look, we have done it. And so from a political point of view, it made sense for Dublin, Lisbon, and Madrid. Madrid only had a program for the, for the banking sector. Look, don't forget, in Spain, all this campaign was, we are going to avoid a resgate. It means a bailout. That was, we are going to avoid it. In fact, they did not avoid for the banks, but so they were so happy and they say, we don't need any more. Hmm. The same to Portugal. Apply to Portugal and Ireland, of course, as well. And I think Cyprus is going to happen the same, but let's see. And by the way, we should also speak about other things that we have not spoken. The countries that we have avoided bailouts, because we only speak about those that, for Slovenia, was very close, and Italy. In November 2011, in the G20, I mean, Italy was very close to a bailout program. By the way, that was the idea of the IMF at that time. It was a complete mistake. You remember what happened in the can? And so it was not only the creation of the, the new instruments, and it was not only successful, I think, bailout programs, because basically it was successful in, in terms of the countries coming back to the markets. We still have the problem with Greece. But it was also the fact that we could avoid a bailout for Italy that was extremely imminent at a certain moment. And for me, it would have been the disaster that we, have to avoid, that we had to avoid. And also other countries that were very close. Uh, namely Slovenia, and that it was possible to, to avoid. But from that point of view, the basic decisions, and by the way, and why did those countries start so, long, so late the, the bailouts? Because they did not want. Mm. We, were, we were, the commission, were telling them, you should do it both, uh, uh, sooner rather than later. Ireland, Portugal, and uh, they, they resisted until the very late moment, because in reputational terms, they believed that us for support was very, very negative. I'll take the very last question from the lady there. Yes, yeah, Céline Caro, Konrad Adenauer Foundation, a German political foundation. I have a question uh, to uh, both of you. 
um, besides TTIP, what could uh, be done at the transatlantic level to encourage uh, growth in, e in the EU? Do you think the Americans should invest more in EU to support the Juncker plan? Shall we work better together on this? Or do you have other ideas? I would be interested in this. Thank you. Well, um, of course, TTIP would have a big impact to, to growth. And I do hope that uh, we achieve a deal as soon as possible and, and, uh, and if, if possible, <laughs> already during the, the current administration. But if that is not possible, I really want that uh, post-election period would be uh, as open to international trade as, uh, as it has been. So I don't, to be, uh, to choke with a, with a serious matter a bit, uh, I don't think the American companies are so bad that they could not compete with American companies. So there is no, no uh, need to fear uh, for fairer and more open trade. So that's why let's have a deal and it will stimulate the economy. But um, I think the main issue, uh, apart from uh, TTIP, is that I do hope that American investors and, uh, and, uh, and companies would look very carefully what is going on in Europe. So um, even though the internal market projects don't usually end up to the headlines of the papers, uh, it's real stuff. It's a real issue. And, and I, I'm sure that American companies can find a value of new market. So instead of selling your products to 28 different countries uh, and, and try to adapt to 28 different regulatory environment, once we create digital single market or more harmonized uh, regulatory environment in energy market, it's a one market, it's a new market. And it will change the business environment in Europe quite significantly. So that's why that is one of the purposes uh, of my visit here. I try to explain what things are changing the business environment in Europe. And, and, uh, and if, I, I think that if we manage to show the concrete results, what has changed, it may uh, increase the attractiveness of Europe, of Europe in, in the eyes of uh, American investors. I agree with what uh, Ilke just said. Let me just highlight one point where I believe American cooperation will be very well received. And indeed, I know that some of the big American companies are already are offering their support is on yes. the refugee issue. I know some of them, including big banks, including some major corporations that, uh, in fact, they, they, they came to me and they said, look, what can we do to help? Because... Um, this refugee and illegal migration issue is, for me, the most important challenge we have, at least since, let's say, at the end of the Cold War, if not since the beginning of the European integration. Because it's putting a lot of pressure in our political systems, the rise of populist extremist parties. And so how can we, and those, those um, we need to mobilize public support, but also private support to accommodate those refugees to train them, train them, job training. We, are, we need to integrate them. It's a huge challenge because some of our countries, they have not experience of multicultural, let's say, life. Uh, and uh, uh, that will be a concrete. So I think we should work on multi-stakeholder coalitions with the governments, with the commission, with the public authorities, and with companies on both sides of the Atlantic to try to help solve this issue. Because if not, there will be a backlash against European integration, against globalization in general. Countries closing, nationalizing, and that is a specific, apart from TTIP, about, apart from the investment plan, about what the companies are doing, and frankly, I think if I was an investor, I would be much more interested in investing in Europe than in other parts of the world. Look at what happened in some of the emerging markets, frankly. Those who were giving us some time lessons how to deal with the debt crisis, come on. They have not yet solved other problems. Europe has, is, is growing under potential, 
But TREP is basically rule of law, basically confidence, I mean, business friendly. So, and so you can probably not gain everything now, but in the longer term, in terms of investment, it's much safer, Europe, also because of the, of the exchange rate, than going to some uh, emerging markets that they may swallow your earnings uh, in one day for a, in terms of a devaluation or something like that. So, so, so Europe is basically a good place to do business. Having said that, now we have a, this concern, and I will, I will put uh, more commitment on, on working with the business leaders on that matter. Well, <clears throat> let me conclude with three thanks. First for you, Vice President Katainen, for joining us, helping us in understanding better what's, uh, how Europe is moving. We are very, we were very happy to have you here because we are really fan of Europe uh, as Atlantic Council. Uh, the second thing is for Jose Manuel Barroso for uh, also being on the stage, uh, having been on the stage, and for joining and sharing the Euro Growth Initiative, where we want to come out in the coming month on uh, with issue briefs, uh, reports, events that try to explain how challenges in Europe can become opportunities, not just opportunities for Europeans and for Europe, but for the United States, for the whole world, because a stronger Euro Europe is a benefit for everybody. And the third thank, of course, is to Marie Kasparet and for the Atlantic Council team for having helped me in organizing this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please thank stay you. seated. Thanks a lot. <clears throat>